The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 751, for Monday, March 4th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, more tips, our tips, your tips. Did I mention tips? More tips than you can shake a tip at. And I don't even know what that means, <laughs> but that's how it's going to be. Sponsors for this episode include LinkedIn Jobs at LinkedIn.com slash MGG, Text Expander at TextExpander.com slash podcast. BB at it from barebones.com. And the reason we have so many tips is because the goal is for each and every one of us to learn at least five new things every single time we get together. And that's what we're going to do today here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, where I'm shaking my fist at people that won't clear their sidewalk or clear their cars of snow after a snowstorm. This is John F. Braun. Well, you'll be proud of me, John F. Braun. I just came in from running the snowblower. Uh, we don't have sidewalks, so that that's not really an issue here. But but I ran my snowblower anyway because I needed to clear stuff. So I do always clear a nice little spot um, for our mail carrier to be able to get to the mailbox. So there's... Well, that's that. my concern is that, that's that you know, I don't want to endanger them by having, you know... Especially overnight when it goes below freezing and then it turns into tr a treacherous, icy path of death. So I mentioned that I think about this, folks. I, I'm going to share uh, something that has nothing to do with Mac Geek Gab, uh, except that we talk about, you know, how my office is separate from my house here. The previous owners built this building that my office and, and studio is in. And it's awesome, except and it's really great, actually. Uh, because the way they positioned it, you can't see one of the neighbor's houses from the main house. So it really does create like this, this nice little private feeling kind of, you know, compound for us here, which is freaking awesome. Except where they positioned it blocks the sun because it's on the south side of my driveway. So it blocks the sun. So I have this office building shadow shaped icy death pond that lives in my driveway <laughs> for most of the winter and where it's really dangerous is when there is snow on it because you forget you're walking in the snow where the ice has melted and then you are suddenly not walking in the snow where the ice has melted but it looks the same until you're on your butt and that's no fun I actually I really hurt myself last winter but uh, but anyway so when you're when you're building buildings, think about where the sun might be, uh, especially if you have ice to melt. So there you go. That's my uh, that's tip number one that I wasn't even planning on sharing. No, that's good advice because actually one time I I did slip on uh, an icy sidewalk and actually uh, smashed my uh, Palm Seven. What's that, John? Oh wow, that was a long time ago. Yeah, but yeah, it. Uh, it was in my pocket and I, or, or no, it was in my bag and I, I fell and well, it, it, it shielded me, <laughs> but yeah, ah, that was such a cool little device. That was that device, um, was responsible for allowing us to do our first live keynote coverage from the keynote right. at the Javits center, which Noah Wiley uh, came out as Irsatz Steve Jobs and started the keynote until Steve came out and, you know, jokingly critiqued him and, and all of that. But yeah, so we've talked about this a few times and I'm sure I know we did an article many, many, many moons ago about how we did all this. But your Palm 7 was great because I had the Palm 3. And so I would busily uh, scratch notes into the Palm 3 via their graffiti, like handwriting recognition or whatever. And then when we had a moment, I would use IR and beam them to you. And then you, because your Palm 7 had GPRS capability, if I'm trusting my memory. I think it was cellular data. Okay. Well, it was some sort of data. Yeah. I thought it used GPRS. 
but uh, I could uh, be wrong about it. It could okay. have, but it, w- it was an internet connection. It was some sort of, right. You were able to send email from that. And that's the important part. And then uh, you would email the, the, what, you know, the most recent batch of notes that I had just beamed to you to Brian Chaffin, who was sitting in our office in Austin. And he would take those and format them and put them on the web. And this is how live keynote coverage was done in the old days. Kids, you can ask your parents about what it was like to read along with that. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Palm. So here we are. Yeah. Thank you, Palm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I don't even know where we are anymore, but I do actually. I, I, that's just that was like a nice little trip down memory lane. Another trip down memory lane is with our first sponsor, which is BB Edit from Barebone Software. 25 years and going strong as my favorite text editor. Like, I, th- this is an app. I say it all the time, and it's true. And I even look when I'm saying it that it's open always on all of my Macs. And the, that is a true statement right now as well, because. I use it for everything. I use it to process our show notes, right? Simple text stuff where you're just processing like things like our, our little agenda item in our show notes and stuff. I will use it after we finish the show to do those process to do that processing. Uh, but I also use it to do PHP coding. I use it to do JavaScript coding. I use it to do CSS coding. If I knew C plus plus better than I do, I would actually use it for that, but because I don't, I don't, um, but, but, uh, but I would, (laughs) you could use it really for any text oriented stuff. And when you're doing something like C plus plus or JavaScript or HTML, it automatically senses what language you're in and starts applying some nice little formatting to it for you. Doesn't actually change the text file just shows it to you through the BB edit lens that adds this formatting on top, which makes life really, really easy. You can fold up functions, you can expand them, you can do all sorts of things. And it's smart because it's written by people that use it for that purpose. I love it when someone makes a tool to scratch their own itch that actually helps many of us scratch an itch. It's sort of a beautiful little, like, you know, I talk a lot about non-zero sum games And this is one of those, right? They build it for them. It works for us. We get to pay them for it. And it's all good. Here's the thing. You can go download it for free at barebones.com. You get 30 days of all the features for free. After 30 days, you can pay and keep all the features. Or you get a subset of the features, which for most of us is probably even enough. So I highly recommend you just go to barebones.com, download it, start using it. Take it from there. Our thanks to Bare Bones, both for making BB Edit and for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Now, I think we should probably get to a question or, or six. How's that sound? Five, six. All right. I don't know. We'll start with one. Three. Maybe maybe Three, we seven. shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves here. <laughs> should we just start with one? All right. Uh, proceed. Okay. Um, I don't know where I'm going to start with this. Uh, We'll start with Nick. Nick writes, he says, uh, my wife has recently upgraded to a new MacBook Pro for work using all the USB-C interfaces. She wants to get a dock for her home desk, but really doesn't like that having a USB-C dock uh, means that she'll be powering or charging the laptop the whole time she's connected. As they say, it is bad battery management behavior. She's thinking about a smaller non-powered port expander instead so she can have ports off of one side of her MacBook Pro and power on the other and can plug or unplug as needed, uh, as told by Fruit Juice. Has anyone found a solution to this yet? He says, I figure an app or utility that would allow you to soft control charging via the MacBook Pro, if this is even possible in macOS, or maybe a USB-C dock that would allow you to turn off the feeding of the power via the USB-C cable. Uh, would be helpful. If this isn't something that the dock manufacturers are doing, maybe it's something they should consider. Combining power and ports into one connection instead of the old MagSafe Thunderbolt combo where you could control power separately from your port connection seems to be a serious step backwards in manageability and battery maintenance. So you bring up a really good point, Nick, because, uh, you know, certainly we have learned over the years that batteries 
didn't, I'm not saying don't note that didn't like it at all when they were just charged all the time. They would, you know, we always talk here about keep the electrons flowing either into the battery or out, but never just in stasis because the battery doesn't last. The last few years, though, that has been anecdotally, at least proven to us by listeners to no longer be the case. Uh, it seems battery technology and especially Mac OS's battery management technology with newer Macs really mitigates this down to something that's just not an issue. And we've had several of you, uh, especially over the last year or so, we started asking about this. Ask, uh, you know, send us your uh, your system profiler report. So if you go into uh, about this Mac, you go to system report that brings up system information. I call it system profiler because, you know, um, I remember those days. And if you go into, oh, I'm not in a laptop here. I don't think it's in power. I think it's actually in a separate battery thing, but it might be in power. And uh, maybe, John, you can look that up for me and confirm or refute. Sure. Okay. Uh, and uh, and if you look in there, there's there's two numbers. There's the number of charge cycles that the battery has had. And then there is the uh, capacity of the battery compared to what its full charge capacity is. And uh, and and it's under power is what Brian Monroe in the chat room confirms for us. The chat room. What chat room are you talking Good about? Good call. MacGeekGab.com slash stream. And you can join us there. And and the chat room is a fantastic place from from your perspective as the listener who's not in the chat room, because these folks help make sure we're giving you the right information, which is awesome. So thank you, Brian Monroe. Uh so, yeah, you have battery health information there, and it shows you the cycle count, the condition, but it will also show you your uh, full charge capacity. There it is. Uh, and that will tell you, and it monitoring that number over time, will see how your battery is doing in general. And you can use a tool like Coconut Battery to really dig into this. Because it will compare it to what your battery came from, from the factory. The, the factory thing is not listed in that health scenario right there. Right, John? <clears throat> right. Um, but also fruit juice uh, at some level will do that if you dig in. It'll sure. Also say, hey, you're at X percent of. Um, your maximum is at X percent of the shipped brand spanking new value. Right. right. And most people, I think, would agree that once that gets to 80 percent, that's probably a sign that you may want to get a new battery. That, that's Apple's sign for sure. But what's been really interesting over the last couple of years is that we've had folks send things in where their cycle counts are in like the, you know, the low dozens, I'll say. And still like with a battery that's years old because it's just been plugged in all the time and they're full charge capacity is still right at or very near the factory capacity. So the battery isn't degrading because it's been on charge all the time. Now hmm. I, I'm kind of like you, Nick, I, I, I still get nervous about this, but I think those nerves are only fueled by the past, like the, the distant past. And, and certainly if you've got a laptop, that's more than about, I'll say five years old, although that's probably more like seven at this point, then this probably still is true. But anything, uh, anything certainly in the last five years seems to be sort of, I don't want to say immune to this, but Apple has, has made some significant changes in both the hardware and software to keep this from being an issue. So, but if you are nervous about it, then your, you know, your proposed plan is, is fine. Get some non-powered, you know, maybe some of those portable docks that, that, that they make and use those as your, you know, as your, your data distribution hub, if you will, and then have power come in via a, a different USB-C port if and when you want it. But there's there's nothing wrong with doing that. And it certainly will make sure that that you don't run into this problem. But I think you probably won't anyway. Based on what we know. So there you go. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm kind of shocked here because I'm looking at fruit juice right now. And so on my 2012, Dave, yep. I'm at 7% of original capacity. So you cut out for half a second. You're at 87. Is that what you said? Correct. That's it, awesome. It, it reports I'm at 87% at 2611 of 1000 charge cycles. That's crazy, man. That's awesome. I use fruit juice, man. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, I, uh, yeah, like you, the thing is I, I, as soon as my machine gets fully charged, I pull the power and let it run down to whatever. And then I'll start charging it again. Sure. And sure. I think because I follow that regime, it's probably led to me getting such good numbers. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. With that, with a machine of that vintage, I would agree. I, I, I would, I would do exactly what you're mm -hmm. doing. That makes perfect sense. Um, with my new one, I have been a little less uh, careful, my new MacBook Air, and uh, and we'll see. But it's based mostly on, you know, our anecdotal listener reports. So if you folks are wrong and I am sharing the wrong advice, then uh, and I don't think you folks are wrong, but I will I will suffer as well. But um, but yeah, how much what how much battery life do you get out of a full charge on that? John, just like generally speaking, S several hours, <clears throat> like three to five kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I'd say it's about right. Depending yeah. on what I'm doing, sure. because of course it's all dependent upon, you know, I mean, are, are you connected to network shares? I mean, yeah, the more you're doing, the more it's going to drain the battery, whether sure. it's doing Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or you know, all that stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah of course. Of course. Yeah. With my new but, uh, one, I'm at like seven to 10, which is awesome. It's just, it's great to be able to go a full day and, you know, not even think about it's, it's, it's a good world that we live in. I like it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, going on to Irv, Irv asks, my wife and I both have iCloud accounts and each have our own separate Apple IDs and separate address books. Is it possible to merge the two address books to allow us to share a single address book? Is it possible to make a backup copy of her address book and somehow add it to mine? So those are two different questions, or at least I'm going to treat them as two different questions. And I'm going to start with the second one, uh, both because that seems to be what we always do here on Mac Geek. Yeah, but it's also where I would start, even if you were going to merge them together. And that is... You want to make a backup. You want to have a copy of these things that is going to be untouched by whatever silliness we might suggest you do next. So uh, on both Macs, you will do this. Go into contacts, go to file, go to export and choose contacts archive. This will make a single file backup of your contacts. If this is way easier to deal with than something that's going to be buried in a time machine backup. I've I've done both. I've recovered from both. One, the, the, what I'm suggesting here with the contacts archive is all of about a 19 second process to restore from uh, doing it from the uh, a time machine backup is, you know, maybe a 90 minute process by the time you dig in there and pull the data out and try and like make sense of it and move your other data out of the way. You see where I'm going with this. If you know you're going to need a backup or even think you are, make one. So that's step one. Now. If you want to merge things without syncing that merge database, then you and your wife could just swap contacts, backups, contact archives and import them into your existing things. And boom, that will import things in. Contacts does a decent job of deduplication and detection and all that stuff. And then you're good to go. You've each got each other's contacts as of the moment that you exported them. As far as syncing them, that gets a little interesting the way to do it it's doable though and i i know some people i have some clients with my dave the nerd business that that do this it seemed strange when the first one asked me but who am i to judge it you know if it works for you then totally fine uh you turn off contact syncing in icloud and then you create a new icloud account and you only sync your contacts to that account. Yes, you can have two iCloud accounts on the same mm. device. And don't do mail. Don't do calendars to this. Don't do anything else. You know, name it, you know, shared family member or whatever you want to do. And 
have you both connect to that again, disable contact syncing from your main iCloud account. And then yes, do contact syncing with this secondary iCloud account and only contact syncing with that. And then you're fine knowing, I, I know this sounds obvious, but knowing that any changes either of you makes to that contacts database will be shared and synced to the other. So if one of you deletes a contact, you both have it deleted. If one of you adds or changes a phone number, you both have that addition or change. But yeah, it's doable. So, yep. Thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? I think I'm with you on that. Yeah, there are. Um, if you do do contacts and things start going off the rails, keep in mind in the card menu, there is two selections that you may find handy. One is merge selected cards, which you may have to do if you're doing a... Yep. If you're combining databases and they also have a look for duplicates feature. But I think as you pointed out, Dave, usually it's pretty uh, contacts is pretty good about not creating an infinite number of the same contact. If you <laughs> it's pretty good. It's not perfect, though. But, but yeah, those, two features are, those two features uh, uh, can come in handy if, if you feel that your uh, contacts database database is starting to go off the rails. Yep. Yep. And again, and even if you're just doing this on your own, if you've got a bunch of stuff you want to merge or whatever, do that file export contacts archive before you start it. Like, oh, yeah, it just is so much easier to recover from. I mean, it's the thing is, that it, it's buried. It, I mean, you can dig into your it, it, it's somewhere. It's, the, I think the, it's the in one, library contacts, if memory serves. Yeah, library contacts. But um, you don't want to get to that level and you no. don't need to if you uh, if you do what my colleague said i'm sorry it's not library contacts it is uh huh i thought it was in home library address book but it's not there either right uh, because a lot of things still have the old naming convention yeah so, anyways i'll, I'll poke around yeah 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 but it's it, it's there like if if things go sideways you can definitely you know find it it's just not um there's better things to do with your time is, is really what it comes down to. All right. Now, now I need to know though, John. So I'm looking here. It is in home library application support address book. That's where these databases are, are stored. So there you go. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Yep. And as Kiwi Graham in the chat room points out, you can also use this kind of multiple iCloud account thing to maintain multiple sets of contacts. You just need to be very diligent about where you assign them. When you add a new contact, uh, you can choose for it to go in, um, you know, iCloud or wherever else you want to put these things. And you get to choose that. You know, if you go to uh, contacts, preferences, uh, accounts, you can see all the accounts that are there. And I don't know that, I get to set here which one gets to be the default, but I know there's somewhere. So you can manage things. And if you, in contacts, if you go to view show groups, that will open up a, a kind of a third pane to the left of your contacts list that will show all of your groups and all of your sources for your contacts. So uh, bear that in mind too. So you could maintain an, like a shared contacts database for the the people that you and your wife know and and use in common, and then you could each still have your separate ones. That that gets to be a little bit, you know, you just have to know what you're doing and and, and know why you're doing it. That's sort of the trick. So. And speaking of iCloud, Dave, yes. I actually just had to do something with iCloud. What you have to as do? You may have, as you may have heard, Apple now requires what they call two-factor authentication if you have a developer account. Yeah, I still haven't done that with my developer account, but I, I need to. Otherwise, I can't log into my developer account. So, yeah. Well, what I did is actually created a new user for, for that purpose alone because the Apple ID associated with my account is different from the Apple ID that I use for my everyday stuff. Same. Okay, so that's how you did it. I guess that's the only way to do it, right? Is you just, on <laughs> on one of your Macs, you create a separate user. The trick is, though, when you do their two-factor, or as I like to call it, two-step 
authentication. Um, yes, I think that's more correct. I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, if it's using the normal path of sending a code to a, a logged in device, you won't ever get that code. Right. So um, change it to use text messages as the authentication, you know, factor, which actually does make it two step, which is kind of cool or two. It does make it another factor, uh, which is kind of cool. So uh, so that you can say log in in a web browser to your developer account, even if you're not logged into that account uh, in your in iCloud on your Mac. It's all very confusing now. I mean, I get why they're doing it. And and I think their assumption is, well, if you're a developer, you're going to grok this stuff. So mm, we're, we're going to err on the side of security, but still kind of a headache. So, yeah. Did you do that? Did you set yours to do text messages or or are you just. Um, I. Just set up a new account, logged in it, you know, asked for the authentication and mm. then it's like, oh, OK, you want to trust this? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So, okay. I think so, I'm good. yeah. So, in order to log into your developer account on the web, though, you have to use that second Mac OS account that you've created. Otherwise, it won't yeah. let you in. Yeah. Which, okay. Which is fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's a, I, I it's not convenient, right? Because if I'm in the middle of doing stuff and I have to log into my developer account to do something, I don't want to have to switch accounts on my Mac to do that. Which is why I'll I'll do it with text message authentication, so I can just any web browser will let me in as long as I have my phone. So, yeah. Speaking of SMS, do we have a? We, we have a bunch SMS of tips about. Well, stuff. we'll we'll get there. Yeah, we do. We have some SMS okay, tips because I, I got something to throw into the. Okay. Yeah. We. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yep. There's, um, a, there's a lot of the the SMS, although it's ancient. It's used for everything. Of, yeah. Well, everybody has it now. It's ancient, except now it's like everybody's got it. It's also ubiquitous. So, yeah. Of course, there's also something called MMS. Mm, we'll right. get to that later. For, for sending images. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, we do have a geek challenge, though, from listener Brian, who says, I have a handful of pieces of information that I need to pull up on a regular basis for my own reference. For example, I serve on a couple of boards and keep a list of the names of the members of each board and their respective responsibilities. Uh, he says, I would love to have an app that sits in the taskbar and I could click and maybe have a drop down list right there of my, you know, six or eight little text snippets, whatever you want to call them, that has all this information right there. He says, I have other apps like Drafts and Bear that I use for collecting text for future Nothing that he's found uh, that has, you know, something that can just contain this list. I, I mean, what he's describing is what a lot of I think what the initial intention for the stickies app was. Um, that's a little clunky in its UI. And I get why he would want like a menu bar type drop down just to keep things nice and tidy and clean. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything like this, which is why I called it a geek challenge. I'm hoping somebody out really? there can send something in and tell us about it, unless you know, John. But feedback at MacGeekGab.com is where where we would like to hear about that from. So do you have any thoughts um, on this? Um, I would concur that feedback at MacGeekGab.com is where you should send your suggestions, Dave. Right. Well, you and you know, also feedback at macgeekcap.com is is a good place oh, well, to go. Yeah, yeah of course. Naturally. Um, yeah. I mean, off the top of my head here, Dave, I mean, notes is probably I I use notes for a similar purpose in that it's spread across all my devices. Am, am yeah. I missing something? I mean, well, notes you're, and, and you're notes missing supports that it's more no I mean, it's not a database. Well, I mean, it is, but not in that sense. What he wants is just some drop down so that it's accessible right there. Uh, I mean, I guess he could create favorite I mean, notes. You make a table in notes, right? Make a, you know, uh, notes supports tables and stuff right now, or mm -hmm. you could cut and paste the data there. So it, it's not an ideal solution, but it's, it's. Yeah, you know, it's doable. Yeah the, price, yeah. the price is right. It's just, I, I use 
for, for data that I need to access from any of my devices, uh, in a lot of cases, I'll create a note for it. And uh, the flexibility of what it can do, I mean, before it was just text. Now it can, you know, do tables sure. and images and, and all that great stuff. So you may want to consider that. Maybe. All right. I think mm. fixed on 66 in the chat room has the answer. And we've talked about this on the show before. It's called Unclutter at unclutterapp.com. And it does exactly this. You can have little snippets. You can see your clipboard. You can see files. This might, in fact, be the thing. That's a good. Um, yeah, that's good. All right. I will. Uh, I'll put a I'll put a link in the show notes for that. If anybody else has something else. Please share. Yeah. All right, John, while we are on the, the, the list, the subject of things that we would like to have listener, Mike says, I'm looking for a great Mac app that will monitor upload and download internet bandwidth usage on my Mac. It needs to be able to monitor cumulative usage, not just since the Mac was last restarted. I'm guessing he didn't say this, but I'm guessing he has some sort of, you know, bandwidth limitations or something on his broadband connection and is looking to to track his max bandwidth usage. Any thoughts on that, my friend? Absolutely. I'm glad you got to this question, though. though may, I'll tell you my answer. OK. If he's talking for a specific machine. Yes. Maybe no. But okay. if he's talking cumulative and that's what caught my attention when I read this question here. An SM, SNMP utility may be what you're looking for if your router supports it. Yeah. And there yeah. is one that I found here called, um, and, and I'll copy and put it in our room here and I'll put it in our show notes here, but um, there is something called SNMP test utility, and this is exactly what it does. If your router supports it, it can query, and it'll show you in a pretty little graph, the uh, bandwidth that your router has been using up and down which huh. i think is what he's looking for yeah but the, unfortunately and it makes me sad here is that i ran it and um at least in my setup uh, it appears that Eero does not support snmp yeah i would say simple that network management protocol and the thing is apple used to support that on their routers until the very last ones. They used to support this functionality. Sure. You could say, hey, how much data have you sent and received uh, as of late? So, um, yeah, I mean, it makes me sad because vendors could offer the support, but it, it depends on your router. So you may want to look at this utility to see if that'll that'll help you out here. Because I think it'll also, I, I, I'm not sure, I think it may proactively tell you, hey, um, and there could be other utilities that, that do this as well. But I, I think the only way you can really do that is through a utility that talks to your router and says, yeah, and he, uses this. yeah, no, I agree with that. In order to know what your network is using. Yes. Um, I think there are some utilities that will show this for your Mac, but where that gets a little bit squirrely is let's say your Mac is streaming a movie to your Apple TV. Well, that's going to be bandwidth going out from your Mac, but it's not leaving your network. And so it's not using your Internet connection. So your your solution of using, you know, some way of monitoring at the router level is much better. Of course, as you pointed out, Eero and most consumer routers don't let you do that these days. So that's not really going to help uh, for most people. I don't think you're right. Apple's routers used to, but that's I mean, not. Um, I mean, the other thing is, eh, I mean, this probably isn't a great solution. I mean, activity monitor will show network activity, though. I don't know. Not if. cumulatively. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm looking here and, and network and it shows data received and data sent. Yeah, but um, not not over reboots. Right. Okay. Like he wants no, to know over the course of yeah. a month, you know, um, there is something called bandwidth plus that I'm finding in the Mac app store that might do this or it says it will do this, but, um, I, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't used it. So, you know, it is free though. So maybe that's 
worth testing. And I mean, you um, can also just ditch your provider, though. Uh, that's if, if you that, if you uh, can, database. right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'll put that link out there. But if anybody knows, yeah, please let us know. And if you're a, you already know the email addresses, but if you're a premium listener, of course, premium at MacGeekCab.com. So and 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 also check your router. A lot of routers keep this data like on their own and expose it in their interfaces. You know, so depending on your router, you may already be able to see this information and that can be really handy. I'm glad you said that because, you know, you and I have talked about smart routers and I have what I'll consider a smart router. Yep. It does have a screen that shows the amount of network traffic on each port. Okay. So you can see how much you've used, like, does it, uh, um, uh, I guess my question is, is it easy for you to say in the last week I've used X amount of my internet bandwidth? Uh, I don't think so. I think with the Eero, what you're seeing is what each device has used inside your network. My, T- my TP link. So the TP oh, link yeah, yeah, yeah. has a status screen that shows on each port. Now it's only physically wired ports. Okay. Um, okay. But, but no, no. Now that I think about it, duh. My Eero is plugged into into that. So, I mean, it shows the number of packets that you've sent and received. That may be a that may be another solution. Yeah, getting, getting a router that reports this information, but yeah, but some do not basic switches, or I'm sorry, switches. It's yeah, a switch. not yeah, but not it's your showing basic me routers. the amount of data that it's it's pumped through it since it was last restarted. So, yep. yep. Of course, now I'm looking, and I think. I got to talk to their software people because it's showing me certain values have a negative, which um, last I checked, uh, sending a negative amount of data is, is pretty difficult. Yeah, it doesn't so. work. Yeah. Sorry. It's not like the electric company where you can use your solar panels to pump stuff back into the system and get a credit. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, I think I, I'm going to have to. Uh, I think I'm going to have to update my firmware because that's definitely. A, oh, my gosh. There's like four negative values that they show in their list here. OK, never mind. I, I know like the Netgear gaming routers and I can't think of the model off the top of my head. Um, but uh, which one? Is, maybe the XR 700. Is that the one that I tested most recently? I think it is. Yeah, that one has it. Uh, but their Nighthawk Pro gaming routers definitely will will maintain and show you your bandwidth and even send you a warning when you're approaching, you know, a limit that you can set. Actually, now that I think about it, it's not just their, uh, their gaming routers. I think most of their standalone routers have that in the software. So, so maybe a Netgear router is, is in, uh, is in Mike's future. So yes, indeed. All right. Uh, let's see, where are we at here? You know, I want to take a second minute here, John, and talk about our second sponsor, which is LinkedIn Jobs at linkedin.com slash MGG. So I can say as a small business owner, I can say this and it is so true that making the right hire is critical for your business, right? Because if you hire the wrong person, it can, it can actually destroy your business. It can change the culture of your company. It like, You do not want to make the wrong hire. You want to make sure you bring in people that are going to make your business better. And LinkedIn jobs makes it super easy to get matched with quality candidates who make the most sense for your role, right? Because LinkedIn jobs uses its knowledge of both hard skills and what they call soft skills to match you with the people who fit your role best, not just people who have had a job with the same title at some other company, right? And here's the thing, you know, I, as a business owner, I always talk about unfair competitive advantage. LinkedIn jobs has that because people that are looking for a job might not be the people that are looking for what you have to offer. And they may not be the people that you're looking for. Somebody that has a job might be the exact right candidate, but they might not be on all the job boards. Well, here's where LinkedIn's competitive advantage comes in. People that have jobs use LinkedIn like 70 percent 
of the workforce uses LinkedIn. It's crazy, right? People come to LinkedIn every day to learn and advance their careers. So LinkedIn understands what they're interested in and is looking for, which means when you use LinkedIn jobs to hire somebody, your matches are based on so much more than just a resume. They're based on skills and background, but also interests, activities, passions. And this lets you match to a group of the most relevant qualified candidates for your role so that you can focus on the candidates that you want to spend time talking with and you can make that quality hire that excites you. Customers rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires and now you can do it too. Post a job today at linkedin.com slash MGG and you get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash MGG. You get $50 off your first job post. I've used this. It's fantastic. I am happy that they are offering this deal to you as well. Our thanks to LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash MGG for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Uh, let's move on to some tips, shall we, my friend? Good? Surely. Surely. And stop calling me Shirley. I know. I know. Couldn't. I couldn't resist. I couldn't I resist. Know. I just watched Airplane the other night, so really my son had never seen it so it was oh my gosh i know right yep yeah i mean it's it's almost a requirement in order to be like that's why we watched it part yeah. of the cool kids right yeah yeah all right um some tips ben uh shares a quick tip he says i normally use calendar and week view on my mac and navigate to next or previous weeks with command plus right or command plus left. Uh, he says, I just discovered that adding option to this shortcut shifts the calendar one day at a time. This can be super handy folks for seeing a week. That's not just running, you know, Sunday to Monday or whatever it is. Sometimes you want to see Wednesday to Tuesday or something like that. This lets you do that. It says you can find the modified command in the view menu. These commands are normally next and previous, with option held down in the view menu, they become next alternate and previous alternate. He says, I tested this in day, month, and year views, and the modified, modified command doesn't seem to have a different effect, so it's only really special in week view. He says, I find it useful as I sometimes want to compare two days that are within a week of each other, but in adjacent weeks like last Friday and this Wednesday. So there you go. Thank you so much, Ben. This is what I love about quick tips. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pretty cool, huh, John? Quick. Yeah. So listener Mark finds a tip that's, um, you know, sort of the anti-cool stuff found. Uh, it's a he, fish shake. Yeah. Is it a fish shake or a finger rag? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what level we're at here. He says this, it's, but, it's, yeah. a, it's whatever it is, it's about crash plan, uh, which Mark says was previously a well-respected cloud backup. He says, as most people know, they got rid of their consumer level service, but have a small business service for 10 bucks a month per device. He says, this was worth it to me until my wife got a new MacBook Air and we had problems with Time Machine. So I decided to download a restore from CrashPlan. It turns out you can only download 250 megabytes at a time. When I called support and asked them what kind of crash this was supposed to help with, they said that larger downloads would back up their system. They created a ticket for me, which said that I'd be called within two business days. Several days later, a no call. I received another email asking why I haven't responded to the customer service ticket. Not only is their service essentially worthless as a protection against catastrophic data loss, but their customer support is now equally worthless. I will be dropping them like a hot potato. He says, luckily, we had done carbon copy cloner backups of our data. Um, can't have enough backups. So, and he says, without you guys, I wouldn't have been so well equipped to handle this problem. So many thanks. Well, you're welcome. And I'm glad that's what we do here. That's why we do it. Um, so, you know, this is, but this is interesting, right? Cause we always say have backups, but more than that, we say, test your restore, right? Make sure that you know how to restore your data from a backup because you don't want to be figuring that out when, you know, when, when, when the proverbial stuff has hit the fan, you want to sort of know what you're doing. I don't think I can add to that advice and test by downloading everything, but it sure seems like I should add that to our advice, but we really, that's unrealistic, John. So the question is at least know what your provider 
will let you download. To my knowledge, Backblaze will let you download everything. Crash Plan, as it turns out, has a limit. Uh, so, and and Backblaze, according to Brian Monroe in the chat room, says they will even send you a hard drive if you need it. Uh, if your download speeds aren't fast enough to slurp down your data, you know, in a reasonable time, you can have them, you know, image it onto a hard drive. And, and I think you have to buy the drive from them or send it back. But whatever it is, they'll send you your data on a drive so you can get it FedEx to you or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, good, good, uh, good catch there, Mark. I'm glad it. I'm glad you didn't get caught, and I'm glad, especially glad that you shared this with us, so that ho hopefully no one listening will get caught by this. So there you go. Good. Yeah, yeah I, I know. The same thing back when I was looking at cloud services. I think Box.com also mm -hmm. had a limitation, and that they wouldn't, if you were a cheapskate like me, they wouldn't allow you to transfer files over a certain size and it's just like dude then again you know i mean you get what you pay for right yeah but with crash plan he was paying like that like th this no, wasn't it, the cheap service yeah exactly yeah they're just tightening up their yeah and it's i don't know that i'm into that not good not good all free market you know i mean yeah exactly right go somewhere else yeah no and that's what mark is going to do the, the part that sucks is now he has to upload all that data again that he, you know, seeded to yeah. crash plan. So, yeah. Another Mark has a bit of advice. He says the best computer advice anyone ever gave me other than don't get caught. Of course, he says was this don't run any computer program continuously. Always exit the app every now and then. I couldn't agree more with this advice. Mac OS gets weird it apps start leaking memory, even if they're like, especially perhaps if they are, you know, apps you use all the time, like Safari is terrible at this. Uh, I, like, this is great advice. I use an app called Quitter from Marco Arment, um, and it's available for free, which is awesome at Marco.org slash apps. And uh, I have it set. You can set it. It's really cool. You can set it to either hide or quit an app after that app has not been used for a specified period of time. So you could be using your computer, doing other things. If you haven't touched whatever that app is, it will quit it. So for Safari, for example, I have it set to 120 minutes. It's rare that I don't use Safari for two hours, except after I've left my desk for the day. And so I know that when I come to my office in the morning, Safari has quit and I'm at least restarting Safari once a day makes a huge difference. And I do the same thing with other apps and then things that, that, you know, I open like preview where I'll open it and do something and then forget that it's open. I have that set to 30 minutes Just, you know, get rid of it, quit it. I'm fine. I'll come back to it if I need to. It's no big deal, but um, yeah, highly recommended good stuff. And you can also use uh, if you're using app tamer uh, from St. Clair software, it has that same sort of functionality in it. So uh, if you've got that and you're using it for other things, then app tamers um, perfect for that too. So do you use any of these apps, John? No. Okay. Do you I do quit? it old school? You do it old school. Okay. All right. So it's, you, yeah. you do it. Yeah, I mean, okay. I'll rotate through the apps, you know, with command tab, yep. which as everybody knows, but if you don't let you go through apps um, running on your Mac. And then if you highlight one and you, I, I believe it's and cue it, it kills it off. Yeah. So I will do that on occasion to uh, free things up because if you're not using an app, uh, I have it take up resources. Yeah, which, exactly. Uh, yeah. And sometimes be disastrous. As, yeah. as you've pointed out, it's like, well, even before the, <laughs> when we were starting to show up here, you're like, um, audio hijack was like, like consuming like massive amounts of something. And it's like, okay, let's quit it. Let's quit it. Start it up again. Right. Yeah. No. And you know what it is? It's that I, this is not the first podcast I've recorded today. Uh, I did my gig gab podcast for musicians earlier. And normally I quit my apps in between those two sessions today. I did not. And it, you know, uh, I was paying that price. And so, you know, I quit it. And now it was using like 60% of my CPU or something. It was like, it was not okay. Um, and now Audio Hijack is at 20%. 
doing exactly the same thing. I get it. Or so I thought. I think you also did one, uh, didn't you? Uh, did, did you do something across the pond? Oh, I did uh, earlier this week. That's right. Yeah. I, I did chit chat across Very the nice. pond with uh, with Allison Sheridan. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah. We um, we talked about mesh and just routers in general. Yeah. 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 No, I saw that. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I'd figure you're you're probably one of the more informed people about mesh technology. I try that, to so. be. Yeah. But you know, so I thought I'd plug that. But, Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. Uh, a couple more tips, actually. Gobs and gobs more tips, because that seems to be what we're doing here. Uh, Rand has one. And uh, speaking of inactivity, says uh, it appears there is a setting in the edit menu in Keychain Access that allows the keychain to or allows you to set the keychain's lock interval. And and he stumbled on this because his computer kept asking him to authenticate and it was driving him crazy. And somehow in the I think it was the migration to Mojave or something, this got set. So if you go into keychain access and you highlight, say, your login keychain, although you can do this with all of your keychains and you go to I think it's the oh, I, I can actually pull it up, can I? Uh, it's the. Uh, file menu and go to, oh, where is it, John? I always do it by right clicking on the keychain. Oh, it's in the edit menu. Change settings for keychain login. There's a little checkbox there that says lock after X minutes of inactivity. And if that box is checked, then your keychain will lock after X minutes of inactivity. And you will have to unlock it in order to do anything that requires the keychain on your Mac. So, uh, this can be a handy thing, but it's also just one of those things that's worth knowing about so that it doesn't drive you crazy. Any thoughts on that, John? The only thing I'll mention is that when I first saw this question, I was going to direct our friend to an article. As it turns out, uh, it wasn't the correct response, but it may be it may help someone else. But sure. Apple has a dandy article called If Your Mac Keeps Asking for the Login Keychain Password. Oh, which I thought was what was happening. And this could be useful sometimes because, you know, things go awry when you make a. Uh, yeah. When you do an upgrade. Um, huh. All right. Cool. Think, I'll, yeah, we'll put that link in the show notes. That's great. But Apple has one because sometimes, again, things go bad and uh, you, you may actually have to get to the level. And I think that this was the speculation on, on their part was you may actually have to create a new keychain or do mm. a reset something like that that's that makes me kind of jumpy i've i've not had to do that i don't know if you ever have dave to, to i, a I i've done it or yeah i've done it i certainly for others when helping them i can't i know i had some keychain problem years ago i may have had to do this i can't remember but but yes i mean it, it like that is an option it's sort of a mess having to do that but it, i mean sometimes that's what you got to do so, yeah, because I guess the key, the passwords for the keychain and, and your account get out of sync and then it's like right. all confused. And, and so um, but anyways, uh, sometimes just notes. changing mm -hmm. your system password can help solve that because right, right. right. Because when you change your password, it goes and rewrites your password to your login keychain to sync all that up. And that can actually solve that problem. So that that's another one of those things. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Lauren, we were talking many, many episodes ago. Well, not that many, but maybe 20 episodes or so ago about uh, various cloud solutions and uh, in terms of syncing PDFs. And Lauren says, guys, you were seriously overthinking this. With PDFs, the answer, of course, is Acrobat. Their free reader is available on all platforms. And with a free Adobe account, you can save any PDFs you open in Acrobat inside Adobe's free document cloud. You can specify you can specifically save a document to the cloud. But if you navigate to the document cloud from Acrobat, it will even show you recently viewed documents that weren't specifically uploaded. So that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Just bear that in mind. It's going to do that. Uh, he says the system is crazy easy to use. I don't know exactly how much free storage you get in Adobe's document cloud, 
but it's a lot. I have hundreds of PDFs uploaded for instant access anywhere. It's enough to wean me off of preview on my Mac because it's just so convenient. And did I mention it's completely free? Thanks, Lauren. That's uh, that's good to know. I hadn't hadn't even thought about that as an option, which is what I love wow. about doing this show. Yeah, I'm kind of baffled um, that Adobe's offering something for free. <laughs> I know, right? Well, especially because most 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 people view a lot of these, you know, migration to cloud services as kind of a cash grab. So, yep. uh, hey, thanks, Adobe. Yep. No, it's it's. I agree with you. Yeah. No, it's great. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where are we now, John? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um, we are at Jeff. So right. in uh, Mac Geek 750, we talked about deleting the contents of a folder hierarchy without actually deleting the hierarchy, without deleting the folders and all of that stuff. And we came up with a terminal command eventually that would allow us to do this. Listener Jeff came up with sort of a, or found sort of a different solution. Uh, he says, I found an Apple script that doesn't do that, but it does copy and paste a folder structure without the files that are in it handy if you use the same structure for different projects and this might work for folks that were curious. And so uh, he sent us a link to the YouTube video that explains exactly how to do this. So we'll put that in the show notes. So thank you very much, Jeff. That's good stuff. I love it when I love it when we get follow-ups like this, don't you, John? Indeed. Thoughts, thoughts on this one before we, uh, before no, we move it's on? A, Hey, it's a different vector into uh Solving the problem. It's a different vector into solving the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Indeed. You know, we have a bunch of tips from the last episode here, like a crazy amount. Um, one tip I'm going to give you is our third sponsor, which is Text Expander. Where at textexpander.com slash podcast, you can, like, I talk about utilities that are invaluable to me and I can't live without and text expander is far and away one of them that is on this list has been on this list. And I can't imagine I'd ever take it off. And the reason is what text expander lets me do is perfectly, you know, sometimes you send out an email, like, like a customer service response or, or whatever, like something, somebody asks a question. It's a question you get asked a lot and you take your time and you craft the email and you check through it. You make sure there's no typos and it's, communicating very clearly what you want to say. This is really important when you've got like customer service stuff that you're doing. And then you send the email. And the next time you get that same question or something similar, you dig through your outbox and like where in your sent box and like, where is that? And you copy and you paste it and you realize that in pasting it and sending the same response, it has like a forwarded mark in it somewhere. And you're like, oh crap, that doesn't look so good. And it just took you a long time to do that. Well, what text expander lets you do is you do that finely crafting and then you put that in text expander. And the next time you have to send that same email response, you just either invoke it with a click of a mouse or you type a little shortcut that expands into it. Hence text expander and boom, this perfectly crafted reply of yours is ready to go and guess what? You don't have to proofread it. You don't have to look at it. You don't have to worry because it's your reply. This syncs to all of your devices. If you're on a team with others, the replies or the snippets sync to everyone. Really, really handy stuff. And I use it for all kinds of things uh, that I do either on a recurring basis and or that I don't want to get wrong. I mean, I don't want to get anything wrong. But things like addresses, especially when, you know, somebody says, oh, send me your address so I can send you this thing. It's like, OK, I got to type it out. I got to format it right. I got to make sure I get the zip code and put the space and the thing at the comma. And the, no, I just type, you know, D-H-A-D-D -D and it boom, it blasts out my address. Or if somebody says, hey, I want to send you and John something. Boom. J-B-A-D-D. -D, boom. I don't even put the F in there because I'm so efficient and I know that it's John Braun. Right. So because he's John F. Braun to you. And that's how it works. Uh, 
Text Expander is fantastic for all of this and more. You got to check it out. So go to textexpander.com slash podcast where you can get 20% off of your first year subscription. Again, that's textexpander.com slash podcast. Our thanks to the folks at Text Expander for uh, sponsoring this episode. Very cool stuff. Okay, uh, more tips from 750. I promised we were talking about SMS, John. And boy, howdy, mm-hmm. did we get a lot of responses about this. So um, we'll see if we can pull them all together here. Scott says, uh, like Jeremy, I am involved with my kid's Boy Scout troop. And we happen to have just started setting up and using a tool called troopwebhost.org, which allows us to do everything needed to manage a scout troop. And he says they offer Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, which is great. Uh Troopwebhost.com. So, dot org. Okay. Uh, this is one feature of this tool is that it allows us to send mass email and mass SMS messages. The interesting thing on SMS is that each person needs to input their cell phone number. Of course, that makes sense. And their carrier. Then the system will now have what it needs to send the mass SMS. It says, I don't know what service it uses, but I think it might just be using email. The reason I think this is because the number and carrier it fills in a way that they call the SMS text message address. And the data looks like phone number at txt.att.net for AT&T folks or phone number at messaging.sprintpcs.com or phone number at vtex.com. This is very, very cool. Uh, He says, I tested by sending my cell phone an email. I'm at AT AT&T. And the message came from a 410 area code number, but it worked. So so all Jeremy needs to do is identify each person's carrier and find out the stuff that comes after the at sign. And they can use email to send mass text messages, which is pretty cool. So that's one way to do it. Uh, I think using something like Troop Web, Web Host would be way easier. But, you know, there you go. But the dovetail on that. Yeah. So I found... An article here at LifeWire, Dave. Okay. Which builds upon this. And the title of the article is SMS Gateway from Email to SMS Text Messages. And basically the article said what you said, but the thing is they do point. So they list the email suffixes that are used for sending not only SMS, but what some may call it MMS. So SMS is text only. MMS allows you to send uh, multimedia. Sure. So I guess it's multimedia system. But this has a dandy little table of all of the email addresses. So one solution could be if you know the cell phone number of um, your recipients, um, you create a little email list with that and that'll do it for you Mm. let me uh, me paste that in our room here yeah and the nice part about that is it would not send this group message that everybody can reply to and get really noisy with it's just like a one-way broadcast that's pretty Mm -hmm. good i like it i like it now the only thing that came to my mind when i heard this was i don't know if you've seen the film taken but it was like if you have my cell phone number and you text me relentlessly without pause, I will find you and I will maybe not kill you, yeah. but <laughs> we will have a conversation. I will, not, right. I will not like you anymore. Yeah. And I don't know. Actually, I, I've been pretty good lately about not getting. I mean, we all get SMS uh, spam, yeah. I, I think. You know, I don't get too of much of it, to be honest. at and is really good about filtering that stuff out. <sighs> Yeah. Right. And the thing is, most providers um, and actually I've done this is that if you get a spam SMS, you can submit it to the um, your provider and they will they will filter it, which I think is why uh, we're running into this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're not, it, it's not as much of a problem as it is with like getting spam phone calls, which. Yeah, at and <laughs> also does a great job with that. So with their call protect. Yeah, system. I still you know, I still get ones, Dave, where. It comes up on my phone and the first six digits of the number are the same as mine because they know. Oh, it's somebody I know. Let me pick up the call. And the thing is, invariably, if I pick it up, it either uh, uh, times out because it doesn't hear a response from me 
or does uh but yeah that that that's a yeah. common tack yeah I think sure must the guy that was doing all this stuff well if you're if you're if you're an AT&T customer, I highly recommend you download their free call protect app and turn that service on. They have two levels of service, but the free one is what I use. And it's it like it really makes well, a I'll, difference. I'll double, I, I'm Verizon. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm just saying for our listeners. Um, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And Verizon may have one, too. I should actually. I think they do. We've talked about them all in the show here before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on, back on the SMS thing, it, it, and and I will I will say that you know again it's you know it's just a tool right it, you can use it for good or for evil and <laughs> I I no like I really like for example our local school system has an SMS alert and so this morning when they chose to cancel school they send out I I get it as both an email and an SMS and by no means do I ever allow them to call me. Cause I don't need my phone uh, to, I don't need my phone to, to ring at five in the morning when they've decided to cancel school. I can find out whenever I wake up and look and okay, great. No problem. And so I, yeah. I, but I can wake up and see an SMS and it's like right there. So it's like, it's super handy. Uh, okay. So uh, listener, Chris says just on the list of services here for bulk SMS and voice messages and emails, he says in the USA, uh, we use a service called call them all. Uh, we use it to blast SMS messages out uh, to our congregants when services are canceled due to weather. So this is a, this is very similar to what I just described our, our school using. We don't use that. They don't use that. They use like school messenger or something, but, um, but it does that. Like you can, you're, your uh, folks on your list can choose to get a call or an email or a, an SMS, which is great. So thank you, Chris, for sending that in. And then uh, similarly, uh, Carl, but also Sam, and I think a few others sent in a note saying that they do the same thing with remind.com to handle this. Uh, so he says he, his, uh, organizations that his kids belong to use it. And he says he gets reminders and things like that from his kids, golf groups and swim teams and, and all of that stuff. So remind.com certainly seems like, uh, an option there too. So thank you for that, everyone. And I think that ends our SMS tips, but it doesn't end our tips, John. We have lots more tips, lots more tips, but you know, before we, uh, share these tips and oh we will share these tips i want to thank all of our premium subscribers who contributed this week uh, on the biannual 25 dollars every six month plan we have jonathan c as i said if i don't know where you're from because you're a paypal person and we don't have that data then i can't say where you're from uh, but jonathan c uh, bartek from london eric from trondheim jim from california Rob from Minnesota, Randall S, Bruce from Colorado, Robert from Arizona, Matt from Virginia, Daniel from London, Jeff S, Doug S, no relation, Brian from Tennessee, and Anthony from New South Wales, New South Wales. Thank you to all of you. On the monthly $10 plan, thanking Ev the Nerd from California, Elizabeth from Virginia, Robert from Florida, Stephen from California, Ward from Arizona, Olga from Washington, Jason from Massachusetts, Stephen from Illinois, Nick from Michigan, and Kenneth from New, Th New South Wales. Man, one of these days I'll be able to say New South Wales the first time <laughs> correctly. And lastly, uh, two $25 one-time uh, contributions, one from Rick S. and the other from Randall from Portland. So thank you to all of you. You rock. You rock. And anybody that wants to learn about premium, we mentioned before, you get access to our premium at MacGeekab.com address, which we prioritize when answering questions and when they come in. Uh, and also you get that warm, fuzzy feeling that you get from supporting your two favorite geeks. You can learn about all of this, MacGeekab.com slash premium. And now back to the tips. Uh, in the last episode, we were talking about somebody suggested using the temporary Mac cloning from uh, from uh, if you needed, like I, I use the example in my, you know, in a college dorm room, 
Uh, you might want to set up a router there so you would uh, have your router clone, say your laptop's uh, Ethernet MAC address so that when you plug that in, it's just automatically approved. That's a cool thing. Um, John had another way of going about it. He says, I found the easier and more permanent way to do it is to temporarily, instead of changing the router's MAC address in that example, change your Mac's MAC address to the MAC address of the router or whatever it is, whatever hardware it is that you want to add. And he says you can do this for wired or wireless devices. Once you get the interface, once you get the name of the interface you want to change, look up and save the current Mac from the current network settings. Then go to the command line and enter this command that starts with sudo if config. We'll put the command in the show notes. And uh, it says then go through the approval process. Once you're finished, revert to your Mac's original Mac address and plug in the device you just authorized. The system should be none the wiser. So that's pretty good. So huh. we will we will we'll put that in the uh, in the show notes. That's a great that's idea. A, yeah. I'm just wondering if uh, some sophisticated network intrusion blah, blah device would be able to figure out that you're trying to pull one over on them. Probably not. Yeah. How would they know? I mean, it, it, it well, just identifies by MAC address. That's it. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, if if you have a MAC address and also have another factor to authenticate yourself to the network, if it sees a discrepancy between like, oh, OK, well, here's MAC address submitting this password and then here's a, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, not, probably not a big concern. But um, yeah, my my concern would be. Like, for ex taking my my daughter's scenario, for example, if she wanted to add a router there. The the prescribed method is you call IT, you give them the MAC address mm -hmm. of the router, and then it, they let it on board. And the same would be true if you want to use your Xbox or anything else like that, right? Um, doing it this way would get it approved. But what hap how often do they require you to re-authenticate that device, right. right? Whereas if they put it in the system, do they sort of flag it and say don't ask this device to reauthenticate because it's no big deal if they require you to reauthenticate your laptop like once a week, like whatever. Like, oh, yeah, I just got to relog in. OK, yep, yep. Everything's good. Well, if that's your router, that starts becoming a little bit of a chore to have to do this rigmarole all the time. So. So, yeah, yeah. again, I'm just thinking on the device level. Yeah. Some tools may be able to say, hey, that that looks kind of wacky, but um, hey, you know, try it. I mean, the worst that can happen is that they'll detect it and then you got to own up. Then, yeah, exactly. Right. Then you got to you got to make that phone call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what happened. Um, we talked in the last episode about actually the last couple of episodes about printing multiple documents all at once. And we've gotten even more tips about this. So I'm thinking we might have now exhausted all the different options uh, with these last two. So Stephen says you can also simply select the documents in the finder and hit command P, which will send them straight to your default printer much quicker and easier than the solution mentioned on the show. And he says it works with Pathfinder too. And that's true. I, then actually when I, when we first started talking about it, it was like, Oh, like I, that's, I, that's what I normally do. But the issue with that is if you happen to have the wrong stuff selected, like it, like, I don't know, I've messed this up more times than not. So I actually didn't choose to just like bring this up right at the front. But Stephen is right. Like this is doable. It just, I don't know. It just always felt a little wonky to me when I, whenever I've done it, but maybe, maybe that's just me. So that's that one. And then Ward and Nick and I believe several others sent in a uh, another way of doing this, John. And that is, he says, uh, Ward writes, so I print a lot of files at once. And what I did is drag the printer from the settings to the taskbar uh, to the dock. And he says, you can drag most anything to the dock. And once it's there... You can actually drag and drop your files right onto the icon. You don't even need to open it up and drag them into the window. Just drag a file onto the printer's dock icon 
and it'll put it in the print queue and you're good to go. So thank you everyone for all of that. Good, good stuff. Any thoughts on, uh, on this craziness here, John? No, yeah. no, I like that. Um, yeah. For those that still print on um, dead wood, that's a, that's a, it's a good thing. No. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, we keep a lot of some things we keep as paper files in the office. Um, and of course my kids need to print all the time. So for school and, and all that sort of thing. So it's handy. It's handy. It's, uh, you know, yeah. it's printing. You could print. Hey, you could, you could even typeset. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know that I've, other than like when I've gone to places like Sturbridge Village or whatever, mm-hmm. I don't know that I've ever done actual typesetting in it. So in I, like I thought it was a good movie. Way. So, so, so quick tangent, but I just watched The Post, which I thought was a good movie and it has good actors. But the thing is, they showcase typesetting used for making newspapers, which I understand they still do that. Yeah, I guess that's true, right? I'm trying to think. Did I ever and see another, that And another movie? tangent is, you know, our buddy Glenn Fleischman. He's I actually oh, sponsoring. Yeah. He's actually doing a Kickstarter, which reached its limit, but it was a tiny, I think it called, he called it like a tiny type museum. I just thought it was fascinating because I guess he and a lot of others in our world uh, of journalists, if if you consider us journalists, would do typesetting. I mean, it was part of the process, and, and actually, well, it's the, part the, of our the, history. The, I've never done it, but yeah, yeah, fair, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the, in the movie itself, it was just amazing to look at the uh, they they so accurately uh, depicted what was involved in building the type, and you know, the little metal bits, and, and it was just like. Oh my gosh, all the work that went into making a newspaper and I guess still is involved in making newspaper though I think. Now it's a uh, more uh, laser than a mechanical technology, but it's yeah. just fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Cool. All right, well I'll put a link to Glenn's thing even though I I know it's funded and all that stuff, which is great. So. Cool. Yeah, but blast from the past, I mean. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I don't know that we have anything else. Um, does it make sense? Um, no. You know what? I think we're good. I think we've. Uh, Are we? I'm. I was going to say. I think we've exhausted um, everything. I'm exhausted, which means you know something. I don't know. I don't know what it means, but uh, it means something. So there you go. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's good. We got a bunch of questions, a bunch of tips. We shared a cool stuff found. We shared a not cool stuff found. Uh, I learned something. We I like like how much I you know there you go right. I learned something. We all did. It's how it goes. I I learned like putting all these questions together every week. Like I, there's no way I couldn't learn at least five new things. It's just it's freaking awesome. I love it. I love it. I really do. And uh, so thank you to everybody for listening and sending in all your stuff. It really, like, it, it, it's crazy that, that we get to do this every week. And, and I, don't just, I don't just mean me and John. I mean all of us. You listeners, us, is producing it. It's awesome. So thank you for your part in that. You know how to find us. Uh, you can call us. You, you can text us, too, if you if you so desire. 224-888-GEEK, which John is? Oh, no. 4335. Yes. And you can find us in our forums at macgeekgab.com slash forums. Uh, big revamp, actually, to the forum. Not revamp, but but an update to the forums coming this week. Sort of a, a featured update, So, which is good. You know, keep, we like to keep things uh, fresh and up to date and all that good stuff. So, uh, so check us out there. Our thanks to Cashfly at Cashfly.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Of course, thanks to all of our sponsors. We had LinkedIn at LinkedIn or LinkedIn jobs at LinkedIn.com slash MGG. Text expander at TextExpander.com slash podcast. We had Barebones software at Barebones.com. Of course, in our podcast marketplace, we have Otherworld Computing, right? We have Ops Genie. We have Eero. It's all very good. Very, very lucky. All of us. It's pretty cool. We get to do this.
You know, and, and John, we get to do this in harmony. And so I think that we should, I know we've, we've shared this sentiment throughout the episode, echoing something that our listeners have said, but uh, maybe that's the best way to share this sentiment one last time through this episode. Don't get caught, get caught, get caught, get caught. Made up.